Good afternoon, everybody. So my talk has nothing to do with the title of the conference, Homological Mirror, Mirror Symmetry, at least as far as I uh, can tell. Uh, I'll be talking about some recent joint work uh, started with uh, Maxim Hunsevich and Pashtun and uh, then continued in collaboration with Brendan Hassett and Andrew Crash. So the main problem is to understand actions of uh, groups, finite groups, uh, modulo uh, equivariant birational transformations. So of particular interest is to study uh, conjugacy classes of uh, finite subgroups in the Cremona group, which is a group of rational automorphisms of the projective space. So I'll be working uh, over a, a field of characteristic zero. And uh, you will assume that it's algebraically closed. Uh, it's not necessary for most of the constructions, but uh, will be convenient. So G is a finite group, X is a smooth projective G variety. So with a regular action of G. And uh, for most of the talk, X is going to be rational over the ground field, so but rational to Pn. And so we'll look at the fixed points for the action, but also we'll look at points with uh, non-trivial stabilizers. So let me recall some basic facts about actions. Uh, so if X is rational and the group is cyclic, then we are guaranteed to have a fixed point. If you have a G equivariant birational map between smooth projective G varieties and the group is abelian, then the existence of a fixed point is an invariant. So if uh, one has a fixed point, then so has the other. And uh, finally, there is uh, an abstraction to a stable equivariant rationality. A stable means you multiply this Pn, this trivial action. So uh, in fact, so you get this cohomological abstraction by computing, so the group cohomology H1 for the group acting on the Picard uh, of your variety. And so G equivariant variationality implies that we, these H1s are equal. In fact, not just for the group, but also for all subgroups. So the way to see this is uh, you just look at what happens to the Picard group when you blow up uh, a G orbit. So you will add the permutation module and the permutation modules have trivial H1. So, and mm, well, so it's an invariant. Okay, uh, there is a result from eight years ago by Bogomolov and Prokhorov uh, connecting uh, sort of the knowledge about fixed low side for the action in that H1. So if the group G is cyclic of order P and it acts on a smooth rational surface and it fixes the curve of genus at least one, then H1 is the mod P to the 2G. So there are several things that go into this. In particular, there's only one such curve, if there is one. And um, well, of course, once you have such a curve on one equivariant model, it will persist, it will stay on every model after blow ups, it's not going to go away. So this was generalized by uh, Schindler, uh, slightly more general situation, the group G is still cyclic and it acts on, again, on a smooth rational surface. And now you assume that all stabilizers are either trivial or equal to the full group sort of a technical assumption that I think should be replaced. Uh, in that case, uh, there is a formula for H1 generalizing the one above. So there is another uh, invariant for actions of abelian groups. So you look at two uh, d-dimensional faithful representations of an abelian group, necessarily of rank less equal than D because they're faithful. And you look at the characters of G appearing in these representations. So then you can look at, so to speak, the determinant 
Uh, and uh, uh, it turns out that these uh, actions are equivalently birational, if and only if uh, the determinants are equal up to plus minus one. So uh, again, the condition is only meaningful when the rank of the group is equal to the dimension of the representation. And so the standard example you should keep in mind is the action of the group Z mod five on P1, where you could have two possibilities. In one case, the weights at you know, zero at infinity are sort of like uh, one and four, and in the other case, you know, two and three. And so they will be different um, you know, based on this criterion. And in fact, the proof uh, here is uh, you know, generalizing this example of P1 with the Z mod five action. All right, so this is uh, what we have in particular, if you have a cyclic uh, group acting on Pn for n at least two, then all those actions are uh, equivalently birational. So the cyclic linear action, so that's important. Um, okay, uh, and I should also say that if you pick any two representations of a group, of a finite group, um, doesn't have to be finite, any two representations, then there are equivariantly stably birational. So that's a basic fact. So the example above by Reister and Yusin shows you could have representations that are not birational, but equivariantly birational because all representations are equivariantly birational. A stably is birational, equivariantly stably birational. All right, so uh, in, uh, the paper with Maxim and Pishtun, we introduce uh, new invariants for actions of abelian groups. So the definition on this slide is uh, somewhat different from what you find in the paper. So after a sequence of uh, an iteration of simplifications of combinatorics, this is what comes out. Uh, so we consider finite abelian group G uh, let A be its group of characters. We look at the Z module that's generated by uh, unordered tuples, A1 up to AN of characters of G. So any permutation of the entries, uh, you know, leaves the symbols of the invariant. And uh, uh, there are two conditions. One is a generation condition that those uh, mm, characters uh, span the characters appearing in the symbol span A. And the second one, the relevant one, is sort of the blow up condition, which uh, uh, includes, I mean, which uh, only looks at, uh, at, at two entries in the whole symbol. So A1, A2, and then everything else is equal to either A1 minus A2, A2 plus A1, A2 minus A1 if uh, the things are uh, not uh, equal and uh, otherwise A1 zero uh, and then everything else if they're equal. All right, so uh, that's a definition. Then you could sort of ask yourself, uh, well, what is the Z module? Maybe it's trivial all the time, there are too many relations. So in fact, uh, for n equals two, n is going to be the dimension. Well, we get uh, essentially as many relations as there are symbols, but uh, the Q rank, if you look at this Z module tensor Q and the Q vector space and you compute its dimension, then what you find is P squared minus one over 24 plus one. And if you do it for uh, n bigger equal than three, then you find that the system of equations is highly overdetermined, and in uh, for n equals three in dimension three, it's p squared minus one over twenty four plus one minus p minus one over two. At least this is what you see the first for the first uh, primes p. So you're looking at the cyclic group G equals Z mod p, and there are some jumps that suddenly emerge at 43, 59, 67. And so that was kind of an indication to Maxime uh, that uh, me when we started with said, uh, 
there's something interesting is going on and there's some connection with other things. So uh, where do the invariants come from? So we now look at our smooth projective variety with regular G action. It, we look at the fixed point locus, uh, we stratify it by components and we record uh, the characters of G that uh, appear in the tangent space uh, at some point in the stratum. And then we just take a sum of these symbols and uh, view this sum as an element in uh, the group BNG, which is the quotient of the things spent by symbols by the relations that I wrote down. And the theorem is that this is a well-defined G equivariant by rational invariant. So uh, there is also another notion, I mean, another related group that you can look at. You can introduce an additional relation sort of pulling in and out the minus sign. And then what you find is that uh, if you look at the projective space Pn uh, for n degree equals n two, this uh, linear action of Z mod n, then, well, in the Bn group, it's, uh, torsion, not necessarily zero, but in the BN minus is actually zero, it's trivial. So if you want to distinguish actions of cyclic groups, uh, in particular, if you want to distinguish an action of some variety in the projective space, then uh, you can look at the classes either in BN minus or BN and, and then you compare and see what happens. So subsequently, Andrew Crash and I uh, generalized this to non-abelian groups. So uh, let me explain the formalism. So G is a finite group. We look at abelian subgroups of G. So we look at their character groups. Then we look at uh, uh, equivalence classes of function fields of algebraic varieties of some dimension D over our ground field K, algebraically closed. And just for convenience, we identify the field with its class. So then we look at isomorphism classes of Gallo algebras for the following group. We look at the normalizer of the abelian group H and G and quotient by H. So with Gallo algebras, uh, they'll come up from geometry and you'll see it in a second what it's about. And there is some technical assumption on, on uh, that sort of group cohomological assumption on, on these algebras is that uh, the map from H1 NGH K star to H1 H K star and variance to uh, the characters is subjective. So don't worry about this assumption. It will be set aside automatically in nice situations. So the group that we introduce is generated as a Z module by symbols. The symbols have three entries. One entry is H, which is an abelian group in G. Uh, then N, which is as before, normalizer of H and G divided by H, which is acting on some K, which is you know, an algebra from before. And then beta is a sequence, uh, again, up to the permutation of uh, characters of H generating the group of characters of H and all non-zero. So uh, the sequence uh, beta there of characters determines a faithful representation of H over our field uh, of dimension N minus D uh, with trivial space of invariance, all right? So, well, these are symbols, uh, and then there are some relations. So the first two relations are kind of straightforward. Uh, so we have a conjugation action on everything inside. We can act by conjugation on maybe even subgroups of G. And then of course, you have a conjugation action on these representations, beta, beta prime, and then you have kind of a conjugated action on your algebra. And then there's a simple relation that if uh, you know, A1 plus A2 is zero, 
again, A1, A2 are so two entries. Uh, then that symbol is, is zero. The interesting relation, the interesting blow up relation comes here. So uh, this uh, symbol is going to be equal to a sum of two terms, where the first term, uh, well, under the special condition A1 equals A2, the first is zero. And if A1 is not equal to A2, then it's a sum of two things. And the things are essentially the same, except the weights beta change. And they change precisely in the same fashion as before when we looked at uh, abelian groups and those blow up relations in the group B and G. So it's A1, A2 minus A1, and then everything else, and A1 minus A2, A2, and then everything else. Now, the interesting part is uh, the second entry, which is again zero if AI is in the subgroup generated by the difference of the characters, A1 minus A2. And otherwise, it's something else. And uh, something else that is a potentially different group. So if A1 minus A2 is sort of a non trivial subgroup in the characters, the quotient, you get a non, you get some, some group H bar check. And there is a beta bar, which is the one less character in it. And there is some action, there is some n bar and k bar and so on. So uh, the way to digest this is to uh, sort of think of this in the simplest possible case, the model case, namely, you're blowing up an isolated point with the Beelin stabilizer on a surface. And so when you do this, uh, on the exceptional divisor, the line P1, you have two fixed points and the first term records, so to speak, the, what's happening at the two fixed points of the action. It's this, this contribution here. And uh, the second uh, term, well, this is the action on the exceptional uh, divisor on the line itself. So you see some stabilizer for that, that's H bar, and then you have an action of on, on the generic point of, of that line. So, uh, and it turns out that as before, in the case of B and G, after a lot of combinatorics, the model case gives actually all relations. Uh, now remember, so they're blowing up orbits, they're blowing up you know, this and the other, so the combinatorics is quite involved. And so how do we compute the class of an action of a projective variety with a regular G action? Well, we pass to a standard model. So what is the standard model? Well, after performing equivariant blowups, you can assume that the X is smooth projective uh, on some of the risk you open GX freely. The complement is normal crossings. And here comes the important condition that for every component of the complement and every element G of G, so either the element acts in the component, preserves the component, or when it translates a component that the intersection with the component is trivial. So what this is excluding is the picture you should have in mind is on A2, you have the two coordinate lines crossing in zero, and you have an involution which exchanges the two uh, coordinate lines. So that's not a good action. You need to blow up the origin, right? Because you want to eliminate the intersection point. So uh, Reichstein and Newson introduced this notion and uh, uh, showed that you can um, blow up equivalently to get to a standard model. So uh, there are, of course, in the literature, many, many papers doing uh, equivariant blowups to arrive at abelian stabilizers for everything inside. But you know, the last condition is slightly stronger than, than just abelian stabilizer, but can also be reached. So once you are on a standard model, uh, here is the definition. The class of X in this burn set group, burn N of G, is the sum over all well, conjugacy classes of abelian subgroups of G, and then all strata 
uh, this uh, generic stabilizer H. So please note that H trivial is allowed in this picture. So, and then you have the N, the normalizer of H acting on the function field of the stratum. Now the stratum again, it could be just a union of, of strata, like a G orbit of points, for example. Uh, so all of this is kind of sort of in the middle of the symbol, oops, where, uh, where uh, like N is acting on what I write as K of F. You should think of this as an algebra, like a product of fields or something like this. So, and the symbol beta records the generic eigenvalues of H in the normal bundle along the stratum F. So, so again, the symbol records a generic stabilizer, the action, uh, either translation action of the stratum or action on the function field of the stratum, you know, in fact, both of them combined and uh, the characters appearing in the normal bundle. So, uh, and uh, just a side remark that on a standard model, of course, the stabilizers are all abelian, but all symbols that show up, in fact, satisfy assumption one. So, but uh, a priori, the burn set rule burn n is defined without reference to anything, to any particular. All right. And so the theorem then is that this class is a well defined GEP variant by rational variant. So, uh, well, how does it relate to the previous invariant? So now we can look at abelian groups, G, and uh, we simply forget all symbols with uh, uh, H a proper subgroup of G. So then we, we, we forget, that means we just put them all equal to zero. So what's left satisfies the, the relations. So uh, we get something that we call burn n g of g. And then it has a natural surjective homomorphism on b and g, which uh, sort of keeps only uh, the action for the, the, the normal bundle data from, um, from, from fixed points, low side with stabilizers of full group g and ignores everything about the function field of that stratum. And then for n equals two for surfaces and cyclic groups, uh, the theories that we have that burn ng uh, recovers completely, in fact, is equivalent to Blanc's theory of normalized fixed curves with action. So something that you used to completely classify abelian actions on, on surfaces rational surfaces. And so for n equals two and g cyclic of prime order, our class encodes the H1 GP car, the other invariant, simply because it picks up, um, if you have a curve of genus at least one in the fixed point locus, well, uh, we see it in the Burnside group and Bogomolov and Prochor of C in H1. So, uh, okay, abelian actions on surfaces, uh, here is so the result, uh, going back to many people, but sort of completed by Blanc. Uh, so if there is no curve of genus at least one as a fixed locus for the action, then all actions are linear with one exception, sort of an interesting case of a degree four del Petzl surface, uh, where you have a fixed point three action of Z mod two times Z mod four. If you have a curve of genus at least uh, at least one in the fixed locus, well, then it will appear on every equivalently birational model, and the thing cannot be linear, so there will be non-trivial cohomology in particular. So that's it. That so completely settles it, and in fact, uh, from this perspective, we see that uh, if you look at the abelian actions on surfaces. Well, you don't get anything new or interesting in dimension two. So, however, uh, note that this B2 of G enters as coefficient group in higher dimensions. Because as you have seen in burn and G, there's this beta that um, 
information from what happens in the normal bundle to strata. And the relations are essentially the relations in, in the groups B, M of G. So let me give you some applications. Uh, so while for surfaces and abelian actions, everything is clear, uh, you know, non-abelian actions on surfaces are sort of kind of interesting. So this particular action of C2 times S3 happens to be the Val group of the G2 uh, road system. Um, so attracted attention for the following reasons. So you can act as the group on the torus in G2, like a two-dimensional torus, but also on its Lie algebra. And so you have an action on the torus and an action on affine space A2. And so the sort of a natural question to ask, are these actions uh, equivalently birational? And so uh, Lemir, Popov, and Reistein showed in 2005 that these actions are stably equivalently birational. But uh, around the same time, as Kovsky was uh, you know, thinking about related questions, and they showed that they are not equivalently birational. And so the, the paper of Eskovsky, while short, uh, refers to you know, classification of all the links, uh, Sarkisov links, equivariant Sarkisov links on, on rational surfaces. And that's sort of a huge undertaking, like hundreds of pages. And uh, of course, it culminated in the like, classification of all finite subgroups of the two-dimensional Kremona group by uh, Dolgachev and Eskovsky, this you know, subsequent um, contributions by, by others, uh, by Prokhorov and, 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 and others. So anyway, so non-abelian actions are kind of interesting on surfaces already. And so um, the approach, basic sort of approach by Skovsky is, well, uh, you, simp you use the minimal model program heavily, and then you classify everything inside. And then you apply it to you know the concrete actions that you have in front of you. So uh, I want to show how our new invariants work in this situation. So the actions can be realized on a torus. Uh, well, the torus you look at you know product of three variables equals to one. That's your torus, and then you can act as S three by permuting variables, and this this. C2 by taking inverses of the variables. And you can realize this on a model, the petri surface of degree six. So that's your S2 times S3 action, C2 times S3 action. Now on the, uh, on, on, P, sort of on P2, uh, you, you act on, you know, X1 plus X2 plus X3 equals zero via permutation traversing signs. And so your model P2. So, uh, that's uh, uh, affine, uh, affine space. This is what you get. So, uh, all right, so what is it on P2? On P2, you have like a two-dimensional representation of S3 and the trivial representation you projectorize. So I wrote down some matrices. So there is one fixed point and then there is a line at infinity. So if you blow up the fixed point, you find that the exceptional curves has stabilized our C2. And uh, you have an S3 acting uh, in uh, sort of on, on the line P1. And you also have uh, another line at infinity, which is a projectivization of this two-dimensional representation. And again, because the central uh, uh, C2 uh, acts with, uh, well, I guess, minus one, minus one uh, on that line. So when you projectivize it, acts trivially. So you have two uh, contributors to the class X uh, and G, uh, this generic stabilizer C2 and an S3 action on P1. And of course, uh, since uh, C2, I mean, it has to act in the normal bundle and you know, it's non-trivial character you know, one. So anyway, the, the outcome is uh, on a standard model, you get two lines, the stabilizer C2. And there are other terms, of course. 
Now, a better model for the second action is actually the quadric. So in this uh, model, the S3 permutes the coordinates uh, on the left side, and the C2 acts as plus minus one on the W. And so when you look at the fixed, uh, at, at strata with stabilizer central C2, you're just finding this conic. And of course you have an S3 action, a non-trivial S3 action on the conic. And so, uh, okay, this is what you have. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the outcome is, well, there are some other terms. The outcome is that on one model, you have a C2, uh, S3 acting on P1 with multiplicity one, and on the other model you have it with multiplicity two. And uh, no relations can eliminate this symbol because if you just think about it, if you blow up isolated points on, uh, on, on a rational surface, you simply don't get an S3 action on P1. It, it, it just never happens. You only get orthogonal actions, but not S3. So in other words, this P1, with the S3 action, uh, you should think of this as an analog of a curve for genus at least one in the fixed, uh, I mean, in the fixed locus of, uh, uh, for, for abelian actions. Uh, once you have a curve of genus at least one in the fixed locus, well, that's it. So it will appear on every equivariant bi-rational model. So, Okay, uh, that's sort of one example, but there are related examples. Uh, uh, again, actions on rational surfaces. There is an S4 action on P2 and on DP6. On P2 is, well, you projectivize sort of like here. I, I wrote some matrices on GL3. And on DP6, uh, you realize DP6 is a product of you know, X1, X2, X3 equals Y1, Y2, Y3. And then you act on the x1, x2, x3 via these matrices. And there is also another action that they look at, you know, A5 action. You look at the three dimensional reducible representation of A5, and then uh, you project the vice this, and then to so of degree five, like M05 bar, you have an S5 action, and uh, you restrict to A5, and the actions are not birational. So, uh, the way this is uh, established so prior to these invariances, uh, like rational rigidity techniques, really. So uh, I checked it. I mean, our invariants you know, seem to distinguish these things, but I need to write it down cleanly, but you know, it works. So in one case, you have like 15 lines, this Zima 2 stabilizer and uh, non trivial Zima 2 action on them. And in another case, you know, we have you know points with the two plus the two stabilizers and lines with the two stabilizers. So uh, anyway, you you can apply. I, I mean, it's kind of in each case you have to extract the right piece uh, from from that invariant, uh, um, but you do it carefully and it works. Now let's go to higher dimensions. In dimension three. Uh, you don't have a classification of abelian actions, but in principle, given all we know about, you know, minimal model program and uh, very extensive classification results, abelian actions should be in principle accessible. So I'll talk about examples in dimension four, where, you know, all bets are off. We don't have, uh, you know, any systematic approaches to factoring birational maps. We are still, you know, not understanding rationality of cubic four folds, even though yesterday we heard about spectacular progress and this direction and so on. So let me uh, give you this example. It's a cubic four fold that happens to be rational because it contains two disjoint planes. I've never done the equations for those planes. And I look at the action of Z mod six uh, with these particular weights. So, uh, okay. Uh, let's, uh, you know, how do we uh, read this? Uh, uh, well, uh, well, anyway, so you act. 
Now, um, um, the, uh, if you look at the you know, non-trivial stabilizers, so uh, there is a cubic surface, there's a ZMOS3 stabilizer in this. And uh, there is uh, also uh, a non-trivial action, you know, of the normalizer of that stabilizer, which is a full group uh, divided by, uh, you know, the stabilizer. The ZMO2 acts on this uh, cubic surface. And as I mentioned before, if you have a rational surface, like a cubic surface, and you have an action of a cyclic group that fixes a curve of genus at least one, then that surface is not stably uh, uh, equivariantly rational. So there is nothing you can do uh, to make it go away, uh, so to speak, uh, performing equivariant blow ups and blow downs. So uh, when you write down sort of the class for this action, for this fourfold, uh, then you find that, well, there is uh, a ZMOD3 stabilizer. Now, uh, again, you need to check that the corresponding beta is non-zero, that the class is really non-zero in the burn set group, burn four for Z mod six. And uh, that comes about because you know those weights, one, three, four, kind of carefully chosen. And so uh, this symbol is non-zero. So uh, in the burn set group and uh, uh, doesn't interact with any other symbols, it can't go away. Um, the cyclic actions for Z mod six on P4 give you, uh, you know, trivial invariance and, um, and that's all there is to it. So this action is not uh, equivalently birational to an action on P4, this, I mean, linear action on P4. So, I mean, we've heard yesterday uh, about these uh, sort of new approaches to uh, rationality, even rationality over non-closed fields. So I would like to advocate for, you know, studying or looking at uh, equivariant by rationality. Uh, in particular, you know, how does this interact with, you know, categorical uh, invariance, you know, coordinates of uh, type invariance, uh, and how does this interact with uh, New invariants by uh, Maxim and Clodmill, um, and and yeah. So anyway, so so that's an abelian action, Z mod six. It's the simplest that we could find. And there are plenty of other examples I will show you. So, um, but now let's look at non-abelian actions also in dimension four. So let's look at the group C2 times A5 uh, acting on P4. Again, I make it you know, completely analogous to the previous example. I look at the trivial representation and the four dimensional representation of A5. And uh, I let C2, uh, the central C2 act diagonally on the W4 and trivially on the trivial one. So that's my P4. And then I can look at the quadric in P5, where uh, C2 would act on the x0 coordinate by plus minus one, and the A5 would act via a uh, permutation of indices. Again, it's a completely analogous to the previous example. So what do we find? For one action on the projective space, uh, we have symbols for stabilizers of C2, and then an A5 action on the projectivization of uh, W4, and again, this is something that don't, doesn't go away. You, you, you don't get such a thing by blowing up. Uh, and in the other case, uh, you, have, uh, you have two of those things. So in the case of a quadric, you see you have like one symbol with A5 acting on the function field of a quadric. And in the other case, you have you know, two, two such symbols. So all these actions are different. And uh, again, uh, you know, you look at the you know deep study of A5 and like 500 page book of uh, uh, Chelsov and, and Shramov that I highly recommend. And it's it's quite tricky to, um, I mean, the whole book is 
devoted to uh, distinguishing three particular embeddings of the group A5 into the three-dimensional Cremona group via you know tools of rational rigidity. Now, of course, when you look at uh, you know projectivization of the trivial in the four-dimensional presentation uh, with the A5 action, it's not actually rationally rigid. You can blow up, you can blow down, there are plenty of models. So this is just to advocate for kind of this new invariant. So let's look at a different uh, class of uh, varieties, uh, tori. So actions on tori. I had already mentioned an example in dimension two. So let's look at uh, you know higher dimension. Let's look at the general theory. So first of all, uh, as a reminder, an algebraic torus uh, is a linear algebraic group, which is a, like a non. It's a form of uh, multiplicative group GM to the n. Uh, so it's a form over some non-closed field K. And uh, so the absolute Gallo group of the field will act on uh, the geometric character group, uh, which is simply uh, Z to the N. And so you have, it acts through a finite subgroup, uh, which is a subgroup of GL and Z. And so you have some representation uh, from the absolute Gallo group of your ground field to uh, this finite subgroup of GL and Z. And so a torus is uniquely determined by this representation. So that's the basic setup. So now finite subgroups of GL and Z. Uh, let's look at like GL2Z in dimension two. So what do you find? You find exactly the group, you know, C2 times S3 that we saw before. In uh, like in dimension three, what do you find? Uh, you find like C2 times S4, for example. And so uh, if you type in gap or somewhere, you know, give me finite subgroups of GL and Z, you know, you will have a list. So uh, rationality of tori, because I mean, these are so special uh, and because uh, you know, we have a very rigid kind of representation uh, action on lattices and finite subgroups of GL and Z. So this has been extensively studied um, Mavis Krasensky, and Miata, Kuryoto uh, Lenz Sansuk, many others. So, but in you know, some of the basic questions, for example, the risky problem, whether or not stable rationality uh, over a non closed field is actually equal to rationality, it's still open for algebraic tori. So, I wanted to um, show you uh, maybe, let's see, I wanted to show you, sorry. Sorry, yeah, uh, just to mention that uh, you know, there's some categorical approach to rationality of Tori, again, following uh, ideas of Kuznetsov, just a very recent paper of Ballard, Duncan, Lamarch, and McFadden. But I wanted to show you how this is done, uh, sort of how do people study these things. So maybe I'll share another one, uh, share, uh, to share this thing. Yeah, so this is how people study a stably rational classification of algebraic tori in dimension four. So, and five. So this is sort of a paper by Hoshi and Yamazaki. And uh, it's you know, many, many pages. And this is what you get. So you dial some gap ID. So four is the dimension four, and then all the groups are labeled and then uh, you see what you can have, you know, C2 times C3 squared and so on and so on. So it's, it's this, yeah, I want, I'm doing this on purpose so that you can see, uh, you know, this is dimension four and five. Now, uh, in particular, let me share the screen one more time. Um, so just to summarize what happens in dimension four, this is a recent paper of uh, Lemire so there are 10 conjugacy classes of subgroups uh, which are not conjugate to whatever. The rationality of the corresponding algebraic tori is hence unknown. So for the following uh, groups, these are gap IDs. I'll, I'll show you the groups on the next slide. You know, there's a list of groups for which stable rationality has been proved, has been established, but rationality is unknown. 
Okay, so let me go back to the slides. So here are the slides. So, um, okay, now the cohomological abstraction to stable rationality comes from a basic exact sequence of Galois modules. So you look at the projective compactification of your torus, if you're variant compactification. So the boundary, um, so union of divisors, uh, Galois theoretically, uh, you look at uh, sort of, uh, the geometric components, uh, the Galois group uh, acts on, uh, you know, the Z module spent by the geometric components. It, it, it's gonna be a sum of permutation modules. So the middle thing, which is uh, in the toric language, PL of sigma, it's a uh, free abelian group spent by boundary components, geometric boundary components. Uh, then there is a Picard, and then there is M. Now, uh, over algebraic closure, this is exact, over a non-closed field, uh, you look at the invariants, uh, you have you know, invariants MG going to this permutation model, invariants G going to Picard, going to H1. So what you see on the right, the H1, uh, uh, well, is, is you know, some kind of an abstraction. So H1, G, this coefficient in Picard, as we've seen, is an abstraction to stable rationality. So when you work on non-closed fields, this is an abstraction. So the examples, of course, of interest are where all these cohomological abstractions vanish. In fact, where all the modules uh, in, in, in question are uh, sort of stable permutation models. So you add the permutation model and you get the permutation model. All right, so, so that's a picture. And uh, so here have an abstraction to stable k-rationality. So H1 of G P car, in fact, total subgroups of G. And uh, uh, so Konevsky showed that in the mention up to three, this is the only abstraction. So how did he do this? Well, uh, as I mentioned, all the subgroups of GL3Z are known. And then uh, what Konevsky showed essentially by classification, either uh, your thing is rational or there is a non-trivial H1. And so it's not stable rational. And so there are simply no cases of potentially, well, stably rational, but you know, potentially non-rational. It doesn't happen in dimension three. Now, in dimension uh, four, you know, here I'm, you know, citing what I showed you in that paper. There are ten conjugacy classes of subgroups of these two groups. So C two times A five, and C two times S four. Their stable rationality is known, but rationality is not known. So uh, therefore, uh, so I'm kind of motivated to you know, show you an example of applications for let's say C2 times A5. Okay, so what's the action? Well, it's a subgroup in GL4Z. And uh, well, uh, you can write down matrices, but essentially it's sort of an action of A5 in, in the four dimensional representation of A5. Uh, uh, Okay, and then the, there is an action of uh, C2, which uh, if you write it sort of in matrices, it's like minus one, minus one, minus one. But now if you remember that you are actually on a four dimensional uh, torus, then um, uh, it's, uh, you know, T goes to one over T. So that's the action of the central C2. So a good way to compactify this equivariantly is to look at you know p1 to the five and uh, hypersurface given by you know, uh, this equal to this, which is a complete ana analogy to what we saw before for dp6. So in this presentation, a5 will sort of permute the indices, and c2 will act via you know x goes to one over x, which in this language you know xi goes to yi. So the only fixed point is the origin, you blow up and then you have uh, on this fourfold, uh, you have a projectivization of W4. 
and you have one such symbol. Now I want to compare this to a linear action of this same group. And the linear action is going to be the one we looked at already, trivial plus W4. So again, with the particular choice of the action. And as before, there are two such symbols for this action. So that's it. That's all you need to do. Uh, these actions are different. OK, so I, I hope I've motivated you <laughs> sort of enough to uh, maybe look at these new invariants and try to apply them in situations of interest to you. Now, uh, in the study of uh, rationality over non-closed fields and in general rationality, uh, you know, the complex numbers, uh, you know, we saw you know, a lot of uh, many breakthroughs, uh, new developments uh, uh, you know, coming from applying specialization. Uh, pioneered by Bazan and then developed by you know, some others. So we were sort of interested in uh, understanding specialization in the equivariant context. And so uh, the way you want to think about specialization, well, first you want to uh, look at uh, quasi-projective varieties and maybe introduce an invariant of an open variety. And then you would think that specialization is somehow uh, taking the invariant for the open variety and uh, trying to compute it via what you see in the boundary. So the sort of naive way of defining an invariant of a quasi-projective U is to simply repeat what you did for a projective U. So you simply look at strata now contained in that U, and then you look at uh, you know, abelian subgroups, which would be a generic stabilizer of the strata, and then you would write the same thing that you wrote before. Now you write down this naive thing, and it is a G by rational invariant of the quasi-projective variety. It's the same proof, but it's sort of not good enough if you want to do specialization because the boundary in this case simply doesn't carry enough information about the action in the open part. And so uh, to get something meaningful, uh, to rectify the situation, you introduce another uh, sort of invariant of a quasi-projective variety, which goes like this. So you look at the compactification of your quasi-projective variety with um, uh, boundary, normal cosine divisor, with strata, and with all assumptions that we had before, uh, you know, standard model and so on and so on. Then uh, you define the class of G acting on the quasi-projective variety as the class of G acting on the compactification, and then plus with uh, alternating sum, where now you look at the G action in the normal bundle, so the total space of the normal bundle uh, to the stratum, and uh, uh, you take the naive class, the one that I defined before. So that's the definition. And in particular, we've now incorporated the normal bundle information. And so this is a good invariant. And in fact, it's this that can then be uh, put into sort of a relative picture, uh, which will be useful for specialization. Now, <laughs> these classes generate the burn side group, burn NG, in fact. So every symbol can be obtained as a linear combination of these classes. And so putting this uh, uh, definition into the DVR setting, we have a specialization theorem. Uh, so we have a DVR, fraction field K, residue field little K, characteristic zero. Um, again, in our paper, we assume that K contains enough roots of unity, all the you know, things, all the orders, uh, roots of unity dividing the order of G group. So there's a well-defined homomorphism which depends on a choice of, choice of a uniformizer uh, from the Burnside group over the fraction field to the Burnside group over the residue field. So, okay, now this kind of specialization was applied in all kinds of situations. So Voisin introduced this uh, in the setup of 
zero cycles integral to composition of the diagonal going back to work of Loch and Shinivas. So Coriotel uh, and Pirutka, it's universal CH0 triviality. And then he has a shin to realize that you know, stable rationality specializes by looking at you know, K0 varieties modular. It's a class of the FN line. Maxim and I introduced Swiss Burnside groups over fields and showed specialization. And so uh, what we've done here is uh, you know, specialization in the covariant context, uh, sort of an extension of uh, these results. These results. Uh, and so here is a theorem that if you have uh, smooth projective varieties over the fraction field with generically free G actions, uh, there is an assumption on the e G action that it extends uh, to regular models, X and X prime, uh, smooth projective over uh, of the integers. Uh, if X and X prime are equivalently birational over K, then so are special fibers. So, okay. Now, uh, the, the strengths uh, or the, the beauty of uh, specialization, uh, the way it was used is that uh, uh, in the generic fibers, you don't find obstructions to, let's say, rationality or stable rationality. For example, you could uh, look at uh, uh, you know, cortex refolds as in Kuryotelan and, and Pirotka. Uh, but you find such obstructions in the special fiber uh, if the special fiber requires singularities. And then, well, uh, if you were stably rational before, then you must be stably rational now, but you can't be because you have new obstructions. And so, but it's essential in this game to allow mild singularities. And so, well, okay, we allow mild singularities. So here is some formal definition. And uh, we say that the special fiber has what we now call BG rational singularities. If for every projective model of the integers is G action, smooth generic fiber X and special fiber equivalently isomorphic to X zero, uh, the class of G action on X zero is the same thing that you get from X. And it looks like a tautological definition. And well, the point is that Again, you want something that doesn't depend on the model. So, but uh, there is a basic example. You can allow rational double points, an orbit of rational double points on which G acts simply transitively, then uh, that's good enough. And then X0 has BG rational singularities. And it would be interesting to explore maybe what class of singularities you know, is relevant here and shows up. Okay, so now, I want to go back to uh, sort of more general considerations. Uh, as we were experimenting with the groups B and G, so Maxim and uh, uh, Vasily Pishtun, uh, we kind of realized that there's sort of a related group, M and G, where uh, you know, the only difference is sort of in the blow-up relation, rather than insisting that you know, if A is equal to A, then uh, you get you know, A0 rather than two times A0. In any event, there was this different group that uh, had a nice interpretation and allowed us to uh, you know, prove, you know, deeper structural results. And uh, okay, so what's this group? The definition is as before, it's uh, generated by unordered tuples of characters of G and then uh, there is this generation condition, and then there's a block condition. Okay, and so uh, we studied the map from B and G to M and G. So we proved that it's a subjective homomorphism modulo two torsion. But you know there were some unfinished uh, things which are now completed. It's actually isomorphism tensor Q. So once it's an isomorphism tensor Q, well. Uh, you know that what you've defined for Mn, you sort of also have for Bn. And uh, what you've defined for Mn is sort of an interpretation uh, modulo lattice theory. So uh, you can interpret uh, the group Mn as a group generated by lattices of dimension n, some uh, characters, uh, 
and elements chi and L tensor A and some basic cones. And so um, the way it works, uh, you decompose your cone uh, into generators, a basis, and then you write your chi in this basis and the AIs are the ones that you put here. And the blow up relation is just subdivision of cones. And so I wanted to say in the last minute that so with representation of MN via uh, you know, lattices, uh, cones, and uh, subdivision, like the composition of cones into subcones, it holds in uh, the other setup as well. We are now, instead of cones of full dimension, we allow cones of any dimension, arbitrary dimension up to n. Uh, and uh, um, you know you get slightly modified subdivision relations on these triples. Let this cone of arbitrary dimension and this character chi, I wrote down the relation for that. And uh, uh, the bottom line is that B and Gs are now also directly re related to uh, this language of lattices, cones, and, um, and, and, and characters. And in particular, and that's the last thing I wanted to say, is that uh, once you have such a lattice theoretic interpretation, you actually have hacker operators on the groups B and G directly. As usual, you define it as uh, sum over certain over lattices of you know, the corresponding you know, triples. So uh, the, therefore, uh, you see that sort of in the Abelian case, the variational invariants, uh, the groups capturing variational invariants are uh, connected to, as we show in the paper, with maximum Pishtun to automorphic forms. And uh, here they are directly connected uh, in B and G. So the variational symbols groups have some interesting applications to covariant rationality. And there is some intricate internal structure that uh, we still need to explore. Great, thanks a lot, thank you. All right, thank you. Let's thank Yura. <laughs> Questions? Uh, uh, Yura, actually I got a bit lost when you start to speak. Uh, you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, when you start to speak about uh, is, uh, is this um, rationality of, 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 of Torah, yeah? of forms of Torah, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how it's, I got a bit lost to get this short as big tables from papers and is it related to our invariance at all or? So, uh, okay, so I was trying to explain, not to abelian invariance. Yeah, non-abelian, yeah, no, of course. So uh, what I showed you, I showed you an example in dimension four. Yeah. Uh, of uh, an action on a torus that's stably uh, equivalently birational to a linear action. Yeah. But not equivalently birational to a linear action. Yeah, I see. So now uh, in, I, on purpose, you got lost on purpose, namely uh, rationality over non-closed field is not the same as equivalent uh, rationality to a linear action. And you already see it in dimension two, actually. We know that the Lepetsu surfaces, as soon as you have a point, the P6, they're rational. So yeah. here, uh, anyway, it's it's not quite the same, um, yeah. but it's certainly related. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the, the punchline is that these new invariants do do produce something that uh, that wasn't known before. Yeah. And I mentioned before. Yes. Other questions? Uh, you're, uh, it's about the last part of your. Yeah. Look, uh, if G is a billion, you had this nice interpretation in terms of homology for this MN, or it's relative in terms of homology of modular varieties. And so it's all together some kind of Hopf algebra structure or something like that. Uh, for non abelian, do you have any? Excellent question. So, in fact, uh, already for abelian groups, uh, if you, uh, it's kind of a completely separate topic. So, uh, 
if you look at uh, instead of BNG, you look at uh, things where we um, keep track of all the stabilizers, not just the maximal, you know, the full group G, mm. and forget the action on the function fields. You get some combinatorial objects that are kind of interesting. You can compute their dimensions, and one of my students computed dimensions, and, and you get some interesting things. So uh, that's one indication. The second indication is that for non-abelian groups G, again, you can ignore uh, sort of the action on the stratum, the field theoretic information, and just focus on the combinatorics, namely abelian stabilizer, and then simply the combinatorics of the orbits, right? So then again, you get something completely combinatorial. I have no idea what it is, but um, well, so by certain groups, one, one can start, you know, computing, you know, S3, S4, I have no idea. So uh, I think it's an interesting, uh, uh, anyway, it's an interesting think, but uh, I don't see, I don't know about any interpretations in terms of modular varieties or modular or cohomology or anything like this. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you. Yeah. It's, it's like characters, I mean, so you see we decompose a non-abelian group into kind of abelian pieces. So one, one has to be able to track somehow the character theory for finite <laughs> groups. Yeah, maybe filtration of the quotients, which kind of you already know. So I only, again, I only explored the abelian situation numerically, and I see it's, it's kind of interesting, but I uh, completely agree that that stripping away the field, just focusing on the skeleton, so to speak, of that of the algebraic or combinatorial skeleton, I think that's also interesting. Thank you. Other questions? If not, let's thank Yuri again. And uh, we'll uh, proceed uh, in 20 minutes with a talk by Andrew Harder.